so Jesus is in this situation he's going against two things of that day he's going against racism and he's also saying no this woman is just as important as any other person school resonate and anyone else watching I hope you're having a great day I really enjoyed these past few weeks where we've been looking at some really tough questions like genocide and slavery and does the Bible support slavery and some really tough questions and this week I want to take a look at another really tough question doesn't the Bible disrespect women and I want to make it really clear that the Bible does not disrespect women the Bible elevates women the Bible gives women a role that they were intended to have and the Bible elevates their role. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some details of this question that are hard to resolve, that we don't understand everything in this topic. And I had to think a lot about this and I'm really encouraged because I was able myself to come up with a better understanding of what I think I believe on this topic and the details of it. And I hope that you'll be able to be encouraged and grow in your faith as well. But I want to t tackle this question through a few different ways. First off, I want to look at the verses in the Bible, specifically the New Testament, that elevate women. And then second of all, we'll take a look at a controversial verse and what exactly that means and how it fits in the context of the rest of the Bible. And then we'll take a look at the role of women in ministry, taking a role, look at the role of women and how God exactly intended that to be. So first, let's look at Galatians 3.28, analyzing those verses that elevate women. And we use this verse in reference to slavery, but it applies here as well. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now what he's not saying is that these distinctions don't exist. He's not saying, oh, there's no such thing as a male and female, there's no such thing as slave and free. He's saying that even though those distinctions do exist, they are equal regardless of those distinctions. If you're in Christ, you are not more important than another Christian. You are equal in Christ. And God doesn't show favoritism or partiality to certain people in the body of Christ. And that is really encouraging. I want to take a look at a few other verses, though, that show that Jesus elevates women just like he did in this verse. So let's take a look at John 4. John 4, 7 through 9 gives the example of the woman at the well. It says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Then Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And John 4.27 continues, At this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek or why are you talking with her? So John clarifies that there's two issues here. First of all, this lady was a Samaritan woman. There was racial tension between Jews and the Samaritans. But on top of that, this lady was a woman. And there was, in that culture, women were looked down upon. So Jesus is... In this situation, he's going against two things of that day. He's going against racism, and he's also saying, no, this woman is just as important as any other person. This woman is a child of God if she puts her faith in me, and I value this person. She's made in the image of God. I want to reach out to this person. I want her to come to faith. And even the disciples were like, Jesus, you're doing something different here. But God is elevating women in, in this verse by reaching out to them and killing two birds with one stone. And another verse that I want to take a look at that shows that Jesus elevated women is in Luke chapter 8, 8, 1 through 3. It says, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod, Steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So what this is saying is that women were a part of Jesus' ministry team. They were along with the twelve disciples, and they have a place in ministry. 
they God wants to use them. God reaches out to them. He includes them in his own ministry team when he was on this earth. And that's really important to recognize because God values everyone equally in the kingdom of God. The ground is level. There's no Jew nor Greek. There's no distinctions that make you more important than someone else. There is equality. Each person is equally valuable in the eyes of God. And the final verse I want to take a look at on this subject in this first part of the question is in Mark chapter 16. It's in verse 9 it says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So this is really crazy because when Jesus rose from the dead, he had the opportunity to appear to anyone first. He could appear to Pilate and he could have appeared to the people who crucified him to show that their plan didn't work. He could have appeared to anyone, but no, he chose to appear to a woman who in that culture, women were as valuable in the eyes of that culture as they are today and as God wants them to be. God wants them to be equal with men and in that society, in that culture, that wasn't the case. But Jesus chose to appear to a woman first and then told her to share the news with other people. So he valued that woman and he values women. But that doesn't mean that there aren't controversial verses. And I want to take a look at that in the second aspect of this question. And the controversial verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So let's t break down this verse a little bit. So for me, the interesting part of the verse is not permitting a woman to teach. Because it makes sense to me that women aren't supposed to have authority over a man because that's what the Bible says in other passages that man is supposed to be the spiritual leader, man is the head of a household. And then that last part of but to be in silence, that is like better translated or the meaning that demonstrates that better is like peaceable. It doesn't mean that you should never talk. It just means that you should be peaceable you should be at peace. But as far as not teaching, that's what I was a little bit confused about. So what I think this means is not that a woman can never teach, but that a woman should not have a lead teaching role. That she can teach, but she shouldn't be a lead pastor who's giving the sermons each week and taking authority over men. And the reason why I say this is because of what Acts chapter 18 has to say on this subject. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria and eloquent men and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So this is really crazy because Apollos was this guy who was preaching and then Aquila and Priscilla, a man and a woman, were basically teaching him how to explain the way of God more accurately. So again, I don't think this First Timothy verse means that a woman can't teach. It just means that they shouldn't have like a lead teaching role. They shouldn't be a senior pastor. I know there are a lot of different views on that, but I think it's important to keep in mind that this has nothing to do with equality. Man and woman are equal in the sight of God. They have different roles. And that's what we're talking about now. But just because they have different roles, that doesn't mean that they aren't equal. They are equal. And this leads to the a question in my mind. You know, if a woman's role isn't to be like the lead teacher, isn't to be the lead pastor, have authority over men, then what is their role? And... To answer that question, we got to take a look at spiritual gifts, the gifts that God gives people, man and woman, that he intends them to use. And Romans chapter 12 talks about that. It says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or in ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts and exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So there are so many gifts that God gives people that he intends them to use. And whether it's ministry, God wants to use you in ministry if you're a woman or if you're a man. He wants to use you and he has given you gifts. And it's not just that men have gifts and women don't. No, he gives each person a gift and wants them to use their gifts. 
And I just like to encourage you guys, like, especially in this youth group, I love this youth group because there are people, men and women, who are serving. And this is awesome. That's how it's intended to be. There's women serving on the worship team. That's awesome. That is what they're doing. They're ministering, just like this verse says. And there's people who are teaching. There's people who are used in that way as well. So God wants people to use their gifts that they have. So again, a final question I want to address in a final verse is something that a woman listening to this might be thinking of. They might be thinking, well, since I can't have that like executive pastor role, then my gift isn't as important. And I think this leads into an important subject overall, not just in reference to that question that's talked about in 1 Corinthians. So let's turn there. It says, but now indeed there are many members yet one body. This is in 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 25. It says, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But no, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So what this passage is saying is that no one gift is more important than the other. Just because you might not be in a teaching role doesn't mean that you shouldn't use your gift. In fact, it uses like the analogy of the body of Christ. And you know, the mouth is talking. The mouth might be in reference to teaching, but that doesn't mean that the heart isn't important. If you don't have a heart, you can't talk. And it talks about in that chapter as well, like what would happen if there were all eyes or all of one body part. So we need variety in the body of Christ. And your gift is just as important, if not more important, if it's not, even if it's not as visible as someone else's gift. So God wants us to use our gifts. That's what I love about Resonate because you have the opportunity to use your gifts. I'd encourage you to do that. But this was overall really encouraging to me because the role of women is in no way taken away from their equality in the eyes of God. So God values women. He elevates women. He does not disrespect women. So this got kind of long once again, but I hope you have...